On today's show, we're going to be talking with Amy Stanton and Catherine Connors, authors of The Feminine Revolution, 21 Ways to Ignite the Power of Your Femininity for a Brighter and Better World. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having us. (laughs) Just to start with the title, what exactly do you mean by The Feminine Revolution? Well, we are starting a whole new conversation about the power of femininity and feminine qualities and really enabling women and men to think differently about these qualities so that they can fully embrace them in ways that historically people haven't really felt comfortable. And so this is about really unleashing these superpowers, emotionality, sensitivity, even the fact that we cry easily, these things that have been considered feminine historically, but are, and also have been considered weak, but are actually powerful. Interesting. So some of the, the, um, you talk about 21 qualities of femininity, um, including things like uh, emotionality, crying openly, flirting freely, um, apologizing um, and, and being seductive. It's, it's interesting. Um, why are these qualities uh, up until now something that have been generally looked down upon and devalued by both men and women? Well, we argue that they've been looked down upon, you know, disparaged or characterized as problematic precisely because they are coded as feminine. Now, some things like seductiveness aren't exclusive to women, but they're characterized differently when they're applied to women versus to men or flirtatious flirtatiousness, for example. Um, You know, being flirty is a characteristic that is entirely characterized as feminine, whereas, you know, when when men engage, you know, in in similar characteristics, it's more usually characterized as charisma or charm or or influence. So when we were going through, and it was a very, very long list of potential um, attributes and characteristics to unpack, you know, we, we had a couple of criteria in mind. You know, the first was obviously that they had been, have been historically coded and characterized as feminine. That is to say, they're primarily associated with the characteristics or attributes of women and girls. The other was that they had historically been characterized as problematic in some way or disparaged or characterized as weak in some way. You know, and through looking at those things, that was how we came up with this list, um, you know, of attributes, you know, and part of the objective in going through them was to both look at how and why they've been characterized as feminine, why they've been associated with women and girls, how they have been characterized as weak or less than or problematic in some way, and then twisted the lens on them to show how, in fact, uh, much of that is social coding, you know, and, you know, just social acculturation, you know, in an effort to show how they can actually be perceived and experienced as powers. Your book talks a lot about power and about a a feminine understanding of power. And I just want to um, point out that early in the book, you say that our power has been modeled on masculinity. Um, uh, to quote, quote you, we live in a world that privileges masculine stereotypes of power, a world that demands women adopt masculine behaviors to attain power and also rejects feminine weakness to keep it. We've also been trained through our upbringing, through social pressures, through cultural norms and values to accept and even embrace this um, to the extent that many of us become complicit in it. We adopt masculine behaviors. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how we do that. Well, this actually really ties in very closely to the origin of why we wrote the book in the first place. Uh, I personally, about five years ago, was experiencing the sense of being out of balance and not the traditional work-life balance, which we all talk a lot about, but actually more of a sense of being out of balance with my bringing my full self to various situations, work, personal relationships. I was feeling like I developed this more masculine style in the workplace, more assertive, direct, 
sometimes tough. And those things really served me, those masculine, traditionally coded masculine qualities. But I started wondering if I had lost touch with some of my more feminine qualities, my sensitivity, my emotionality, the fact that I cry easily, whether I lost touch with them or whether I was holding them back because I felt they weren't welcome in the workplace, unclear. But the the reality was I had modeled myself after a more masculine style of leadership because that's what we thought we needed to do to quote unquote thrive in a man's world. And so I started wondering if that was translating to my personal relationships. And maybe that's why I I was bringing bossy Amy into my dating life. And maybe that's why I had not met Prince Charming. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. it really set me out dive deeper and really start to explore this whole concept of femininity because so many people were talking about female empowerment, feminism, equal rights. All of these things are, of course, extremely important. And Catherine and I are both feminists. That said, no one was talking about this other mysterious F word, femininity. And we wondered why. So I ended up, thankfully, being introduced to Catherine through a mutual friend And the minute we met, we had infinite amounts to discuss around the topic because both of us have various experience in the women's space. I've been working with women, promoting women, supporting women for the entirety of my career. Catherine was an academic and taught women's studies and has done a lot of work in the women's space as well. Um, really interesting work around rebranding the princess at Disney, among many other things. So we felt like we could have talked for hours. And I walked away thinking, oh, I definitely want Catherine to be part of this process of writing a book with me. But I, at the time, still was not, apparently not fully committed. And then two years ago, we sat down for breakfast and I said, let's just do this together. Thanks, goodness. (laughs) And so here we are. And the reality is, the the deeper we went into the conversation with each other, but then also interviewed 50 people for the book, men and women, did a tremendous amount of research, as you can imagine, the more we realized there were deep-seated attachments to these ideas that femininity and feminine qualities are problematic. And all the more reason it was important to really look at each of these qualities and start to question them, some of them for ourselves, some of them were tricky for each of us because they're things that maybe we had judgments about. And that's part of what was so interesting about the process. Um, But one of the things that we say time and time again, it's extremely important, is that there's no one definition of femininity, that everyone has a unique approach and a unique definition for themselves. And this is all about helping women and men find their authentic version and allowing them to show up as they are, not feeling ashamed of these parts of themselves. Um, That's really interesting. You say that there's no one definition of of femininity. And one of the insights that I think many feminist theorists have talked about is the idea that femininity is uh, socialized um, and that women are trained in some ways to behave in certain ways that are subservient and that help to serve and facilitate the patriarchy, right? So for example, being um, agreeable or being subservient um, has been very effective in convincing women not to claim certain kinds of of power. And that seems to be not, mm, not an individual definition, but more of a pattern that we can look at in terms of um, across society, right? Of course, it's changed over time. It's also complicated by um, by race, by class, by culture. But I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about this notion that femininity is also about how women are socialized to accept certain, um, uh, to accept domination in some sense. It's such an interesting question, you know, and you know, and, and an important one. It's you know, you know, I, I think the right response to that is to say, you know, that it's not femininity qua femininity, right? It, it it has been the social conditioning around the appropriate roles and behaviors and characteristics 
of women and girls. You know, it's, you know, it's, it's really long standing. We've got not just hundreds, but actually thousands of years of social conditioning that have been oriented around the idea that the public sphere is the space of men, right? The, the space of political activity, for example, the, the place of the space of political rule, and that the private sphere has been the space of women. Now, you know, it, you know, it's you know, we, we can talk a lot about how systems of power and oppression have emerged out of that. It's sort of in their origin, you know, there there, there was there wasn't nefarious intent around dominating or oppressing women. You know, it was, you know, in some respects, not to go into the social anthropology of the whole thing. You know, it was the the way human relationships unfolded. And you can go back to, like, into you know ancient philosophic thought and see you know see thinkers unpack the dynamics of the household, for example. You know, in you know in, in a way that you can start to see you know where a lot of these patterns emerge. But because we associate this goes to your question about you know the masculine definitions of power, because we associate the sphere of political action, of public action, of policy of citizenship with men and have done across cultures and across history, we associate those the characteristics of dominance, of assertiveness with men. This is not to say that women can't have those qualities, but we associate them with men. In the same way, we associate the characteristics of caregiving, of nurture, of those sorts of things with women because we associate women and girls with the private sphere. And all of these things have, sort of have, have combined to you know, create these social patterns that have habituated us and, yes, have resulted more often than not, the systems many would describe as oppressive. Part of what we want to address in the book, and one of the things that we hope is a takeaway, is that if you look at these characteristics and divorce them from the baggage of um, uh, of, of conventional definitions of power, and if you divorce them from the baggage of this is something that is specifically associated with women, then you can start to see how these become actually very powerful human attributes, right? You know, mm-hmm. we you know we make clear at the beginning of the book, you know, and we model it in terms of you know just even in, in inviting some men into the conversations into the book that these are human characteristics and they stand to benefit us all you know if we embrace things like our sensitivity our capacity for nurture um you know our 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 capacity to to show and share our emotion or to be social and that by characterizing these as exclusively feminine and derogating them because they're feminine that we are cutting off possibility to women and men, girls and boys, you know, and that we stand to, you know, open up the possibility of a kinder world, a more sensitive world, a more caring world, a more nurturing world, if we unshackle um, feminine characteristics and, um, and attributes from all the social baggage that attended them for millennia. If you are just tuning in, you are listening to Between the Covers here on KBU Community Radio. We're talking today with Amy Stanton and Catherine Connors, who are authors of The Feminine Revolution, 21 Ways to Ignite the Power of Your Femininity for a Brighter and a Better World. So both of you have worked in the public sphere, um, which is traditionally, of course, as you said, um, been male-dominated. How is it that you um, bring in some of the feminine qualities that you talk about to the work that you do to make the world and to make your your work lives, for example, um, you say better and brighter? Well, I have to say I am very fortunate because I run my own company, which means that I can set the tone create an environment where sensitivity, emotionality, crying, any of these qualities are welcome. And, you know, we're not saying transform yourself into a radically different person and show up to work the new, new you, but we are saying that maybe start to evaluate some of these parts of yourself that you might be holding back and you, that, but that might actually serve you if you allowed them to come forward. So examples of that in my workplace that I tried to encourage one is intuition. And we really, we have historically felt that intuition is not as valuable as the data points and the quantitative information in front of us. And, you know, are important, but 
more times than not, if someone comes into my office and asks me a question that I think they know the answer to, I will respond by saying, How, what is your gut telling you? And I'd say more than nine times out of 10, their response is exactly what I would have come up with. So meaning they should be trusting their gut. And so that's an example. I want to encourage my employees and my team to feel like they can trust their gut. Um, one that we talk a lot about is crying because of course people have perceived that it is not acceptable to cry in the workplace. And I worked at large companies throughout the bulk of my early career. So I've had many experiences where I have recognize that that was problematic. I'm a crier. I come from a family of criers. So I had a few incidents and one in particular that really stuck with me that did shape the way I felt saying it's all part of this feeling of having to build this shell and this toughness and this sense that I can't show this more vulnerable, by the way, real part of myself. So because, and and when we talk about crying, let's be honest, no one wakes up in the morning and thinks, I hope today I burst into tears in my boss's office. So it is a loss of control and it is human, which is okay. So the real problem with crying has been that people become so obsessed with the crying that they lose sight of whatever it was that actually made them emotional in the first place. So what we're encouraging in this place, and I, in this case, and I certainly encourage it in my office, is if someone's crying, what if they use that opportunity to actually connect with the person on the other side of the table? So if it's a performance review, what if you say, you know what, I'm getting emotional right now because I really care about this job and I was expecting a more positive performance review. What do I need to do to turn things around? Or I'm getting emotional right now because I'm totally exhausted. I've been working my butt off and I feel like I'm failing. Whatever it is, use it as a bridge. Use it as a way to actually connect with someone and grow a relationship in a way that you couldn't do without that vulnerable emotional moment. And we're not saying run around clubs. I will say that the girls in my office, if they get emotional, know it's a safe space and that it's completely okay and we can have a real conversation at that moment. And it, it makes, I'd say, the environment a lot more comfortable because crying happens. And it's definitely not the end of the world. Um, I've been, we've had a lot of conversations. We've been speaking at various companies. And this is one that comes up all the time because they say, what if the environment doesn't allow for this? And there's real subtlety to it. There's mm-hmm. nuance. It's about, about recognizing some of these behaviors or, again, qualities in others and celebrating them and giving the space, creating the space for people to be able to show that they're sensitive and not be judged and not make them feel like they're judged for that in a bad way. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's not something that's going to change overnight, but we believe that each of us can really make an impact in our respective environments by showing up as a, and, and modeling this for others, whether that's our coworkers or our children or, our friends, and, and I will say, and I, I'm sure Catherine would say this too, for both of us, it's been a journey of, and a real exploration. I mean, every single day is an opportunity to practice this. Uh, and so that's really what we're encouraging of the people reading the book, folks that are joining the revolution, <laughs> which is let's get everyone on of starting to revisit some of these things and allow these parts of ourselves to show through. And it's not going to change overnight, but, but if you start to integrate it in even small ways, you'll experience a real difference in your life. I'm wondering um, for, for readers and also listeners, um, if you could also give us a little bit more of a picture of how this revolution um, could take place. I mean, your revolution to my mind suggests structural change and it also would would probably suggest some retraining because we have been well trained in in masculine ways of doing things and that's part of the education system and certainly the work environments most of them so could you just give me a sense of what how we could move to um to embrace more feminine values and what what that might involve in terms of what we need to change to make that happen well, I think we would both say that it's 
you know, it, it is a revolution, you know, and it does connote a collective action and movement, but it's absolutely one that starts with the personal, you know, and we think that personal beginning is, you know, is awareness um, and, you know, a sort of purposefulness in understanding how we're moving about in the world, you know, in the context of being women, you know, and being feminine. So, you know, when we speak about this, you know, when we talk to women about this, you know, and men, um, you know, we tend to say the same thing, which is this, that being aware of our own biases around the quote unquote feminine, you know, is the most important first step. And being aware of how we carry those biases into our own understanding of ourselves and our own experiences and our own behaviors, you know, is crucially important such that we're being attentive to the moments in the day when we are chastising ourselves for being sensitive um, or too emotional, you know, or, or, or too, too flighty or too social, what have you, and that we're being aware of when we're carrying those biases into our interactions with others. I, I'm a mom, you know, I have a son and a daughter, and with both of them, I've had to, you know, really pay attention, you know, to the fact that, you know, with my daughter, you know, I will, I, I still <laughs> berate myself for this, you know, can very easily slide into the language of suggesting that she not be too sensitive, right, that sort of thing. So it is, you know, it, it, it's why Watching those things for ourselves and our interactions with others so that we can begin affecting a shift, right? You know, to Amy's point about crying, you know, it's not about, you know, trying to push the world in the direction where we all go into the office and cry, but it's about making space for that possibility of being forgiving of ourselves when we are emotional, making space for others to be emotional and being forgiving about it so that we can gradually start to move the needle. We've got hundreds of years, as I said before, of social conditioning around these biases. And so the most important first step in this revolution is to recognize them and to try to address them in our own lives and in our interactions with others so that we can really begin giving real active permission to each other to be embracing these things openly, you know, and affecting the shift for, you know, not just for ourselves, but for our daughters and for our sons so that they can really meaningfully carry this forward. And so in your vision, you see that these traits that have been typically characterized as feminine are traits that both men and women should uh, adopt and cultivate. Is that correct? Absolutely. And, and we always say every one of us is a combination of masculine and feminine in a good way. So it's about allowing for that and allowing for the feminine quality same way that we celebrate the masculine quality for their power, for their merit. And, and again, uh, you know, ultimately allow each of us to show up in an authentic way. So does it make sense to move away from characterizing these qualities as either masculine or feminine and maybe moving to, for example, a more uh, gender fluid understanding of what qualities we need to cultivate in order to live in a better, more, um, <laughs> more just society, perhaps? It's a great question. And you're absolutely right that, that we do want to get to a world, you know, where we are, you know, sort of carrying less gender baggage. But We've been living in a world where, you know, it, it hasn't just been the case that we associate strength and power with men and masculinity. That's the default setting for us, right? Like we associate those things as human. We do consider those things as gender neutral. So the most important step right now, you know, is for us to acknowledge the biases around how we think about the feminine femininity and the condition, experience and attributes of being female, you know, uh, you know, uh, on whatever part of the spectrum, whether it's biological or chosen. So it's you know, because we live in a world where we do associate a kind of base level default, you know, gender neutral setting that is associated, you know, with masculinity, small m, we believe that we really do need to acknowledge that and, and call out and embrace 
because we haven't had permission to ask ourselves, you know, as women, you know, or as, you know, as, as girls or as anybody anywhere on the spectrum, what is my experience as a female or female identifying human being, you know, and what are my attributes and what do I think about that? So we do think that it's important to put it out on the table and embrace it, you know, and use it to rebalance the conversation about the masculine and the feminine in order to get to a place where we can talk more openly and more fully about what it means to be human. And to allow people to celebrate these differences. Of course, it's an important conversation about whether labeling things actually has an advantage or if it holds us back. But these are real experiences that we're living through every single day. And and in a way, you know, I always say if one of, a win would be if someday when I have a daughter and someone tells her she's being sensitive, she says, thank you. So it's really about really reframing things in a way that allows those things to be celebrated, not admonished. Great. I have been talking today to Amy Stanton and Catherine Connors, who are authors of The Feminine Revolution, 21 Ways to Ignite the Power of Your Femininity for a Brighter and Better World. Catherine and Amy are going to be at Powell's next week, reading from their book. They will be at Powell's on Hawthorne on Monday, April 8th at 7.30 p.m. So thank you so much, Amy and Catherine, for being on the show today. Thank you, Suzanne. Get up, get up.